Metal Express Radio Rockumentary will be all about uh, Y&T, and uh, we're happy to be joined by uh, the main man himself, Dave Medicetti. How are you doing these days, Dave? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll uh, run through uh, your, your albums, and uh, we'll, we'll start with the 70s first. I mean, uh, you used to be a cover band um, back in the early 70s. Uh, did you play covers from bands that inspired you to, to make your music later? Yeah, I think so, actually. We did. Uh, we were not a typical cover band, because the typical cover bands that were doing, like, weddings and, and uh, you know, occasional, you know, dance gigs or something like that, they were doing all the real top 40 kind of stuff, you know, the real hits. And um, we were doing a little bit of that, but we were doing sort of deep, deep cuts of, of bands that we were into, like... Montrose and Mountain and you know all these other bands that that we were doing things from that pro yeah, probably nobody else would have heard. So, but th these were a lot of the bands that were, had inspired us through the years. So, we figured, hey, you know, we'll find something that's danceable, but we'll just play it something different that we want to do. The music scene back in in San Francisco then must have been you know great. I mean, at least for for rock bands, uh, and you, you played a lot of gigs. Did you? I follow the scene. I mean, uh, there were the thrash bands coming out of, of San Francisco at the time, and and uh, did the music scene uh, inspire you to to write your own music later? Well, the good thing about the Bay Area is that, um, unlike Southern California, uh, really were not a lot of heavy rock bands. We were kind of one of the few there. So, in a way, that was better for us because in LA, um, everybody had a everybody knew everybody else you know and uh, and they all hung together and, and they ended up sort of sounding very similar to each other and I think they all kind of you know got things from each other ended up sounding very similar but we stayed sort of different than all of those different bands down in the Southern California way because we were isolated from them you were all by ourselves as far as a hard rock band goes there was only really uh, Ronnie Montrose uh, and um uh, God, I don't even know who else was playing hard rock back then. It wasn't until the 80s when other bands started coming up. And I mean, Metallica obviously started to happen and uh, Night Ranger, which was more, more sort of pop. But, but I think that's, that was a good thing for us is that we had a lot of, a lot of music that was all different around us all the time. It was, uh, you know, I mean, there were things like Santana and, and, you know, Tower of Power. I mean, everybody was so different from each other that I think that that's what was cool about about being in that environment is that, is that we were not anything but ourselves mm -hmm. because uh, we, weren't, we weren't constantly picking from all of the other bands that sounded like us around us. You were called Yesterday and Today at the time and, and in the 70s you released uh, two albums, uh, Yesterday and Today and uh, Struck Down, yeah. and I guess those albums are, are quite hard to find right now before they are re-released. Um, uh, how do you look up on the albums today? Well, you know, they were hard to find even back then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, I love them because it was part of our, I mean, it was the beginnings of, of our band, and, and I especially love the Yesterday and Today record, the first one, because it was such raw energy with absolutely no control. Uh, I mean, nobody, the, the people that were supposedly producing us, were there was no production. I mean, it was basically, do what you guys do live and we'll record you. So, you know, uh, and, and we just didn't know much about studio recording at the time. So from that standpoint, I love it. But then when I listen back to it, I go, oh, you know, I mean, I mean, some of it, not not, not all, but you know, you know, because we've grown so so far from that, and not only in in, in the writing, but in in our playing and our singing ability. Uh, certainly, my singing ability has changed a million fold since the first records, and so, um, you know, it's it's a little tough for me to for me personally to listen back sometimes, but but then again, if I if I'm in the right mood, <laughs> and I'm not and I'm not analyzing my vocals or something else. I, I just said, yeah, yeah, that was really cool for what it was. It, it was so raw and so, you know, completely, uh, completely us, <laughs> you know, at that time. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really do like all the stuff all the way through the years. But, you know, each one has a certain type of thing that it does to me when I listen to it. 
that certainly brings me back to the 70s when I hear it. But um, yeah, so I, you know, that's a long answer to your question. I'm sorry. So it's really hard for me to, to, to say, you know, I absolutely love this or I absolutely don't. I just have mixed feelings about it. Do you still play any of the songs? I mean, like uh, 25 Hours a Day is a great track from, from yeah. one of these albums. Yeah, we play 25 Hours a Day every once in a while. Uh, Beautiful Dreamer. Uh, we're trying to work up some more songs from that because uh, quite a few fans have been asking us to play some of the some of the, the, the uh, earlier things. Um, but uh, at the time of right now, that's those are the two that we'll probably end up playing most of all. Then three years later, I don't know what you did during those three years, but you came back and you delivered an album that was in just great, Earthshaker. I mean, the production was great, your guitar playing was great, your voice, and, and of course, uh, the songs. Yeah. Uh, I think people uh, thought that you had split up, actually, and then you came back and delivered this. Hmm. Yeah, of course, we didn't. Uh, what happened was is that when we were just getting ready to finish the second record, Yesterday and Today Struck Down, um, our manager had informed us that uh, the record company, <clears throat> London Records, had decided to get rid of all of their rock albums, rock artists on their, on their label. And so we knew that uh, all this work that we had done to make Yesterday and Today Struck Down album was basically going to just go nowhere because they were going to just put it out there and then fold all of their rock stuff. And... Uh, And at, but at the same time, what ended up happening, of course, is that we knew we were out of a record deal. And so the next step was, of course, to try and get a new deal. And that just took forever. And uh, what we ended up doing is we just ran off of the popularity that we had from the first record. And we just kept touring. And we kept touring in the States and doing local stuff and spending a lot of time in the rehearsal studio writing. And, uh, and so really, when we got up to Earthshaker record, we had probably two records worth of material by that time that we had been playing live for maybe a year or maybe more. So I think that's why that record was so good was because it, we did have the time before it to sort of, you know, not only flesh out the material as far as, you know, knowing how the song should be, but, but playing it live makes a big difference, you know, Cause, because once you play the song live about three or four different times, you automatically start to do it slightly differently because you realize that, ah, oh, you know, I could do this. You know. So uh, I think that's why that record uh, was such a good record. We had the time in between to do it. So you actually knew when you released the album that it was a great album? Did you have a feeling that it would be a classic? Well, of course, every artist thinks that every record they do is a great record. So <laughs> at that point, of course, I'm sure we thought it was brilliant. But, uh, but still, at the last minute, we wrote songs that we did not have. Uh, Rescue Me. That was a song that was a different song before. Um, different lyrics, different arrangement, different chord pattern through half of it. And, uh, and I, thought, I, th I thought of this whole new idea and uh, we rehearsed it right before we got the record deal and everybody hated it. And so I said, all right, never mind. And at the very end of pre-production, right before we were going into the studio to record Earthshaker, it was like two days ahead of time. And the, the two guys that were producing the record said, do you have anything else? Just any other thing that you, isn't finished or whatever? And I said, man, remember that thing, you know, where I rearranged it and put new chord patterns? And the, yeah, 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 okay, whatever, let's play it. And we played it down. We got to like the first chorus and everybody looked at each other and then we ended a song and it was like, wow, that was brilliant. How come we didn't think it was so cool, you know, a couple of weeks or, you know, months before? And so... You know, the, the producer said, what is that? How come you didn't play that for us? You know, and we wrote the lyrics the next day and recorded it. It was one of the best songs on the record. So you never know what's going to happen, you know. Uh, what did you do with all the leftovers? Do you keep them for, for later or just, just forget about them? Uh, what usually we do with leftover songs is um, we keep them for the next record and then we never use them. <laughs> Because I, I'm always of the feeling that you need to write how you feel right now, mm. you know? And, and not to say that you couldn't use something that you had a year ago, but I want to start new every time. I want to start fresh because now we've, we've had new experiences. We've been on the road with different bands. We've, we've learned more from, from growing for another year. You know, let's start fresh. And then if we feel like we want to move back and, and grab a couple songs from the past, you know, year, we'll do that. But, um, 
we ended up doing that. We ended up sort of shelving, you know, material from one record and then starting fresh on the next and just doing that year after year. And uh, I think it was kind of a good idea in a way, you know, um, because of the feeling that, um, you know, you're always going to do something that's, that's exactly what you feel like right now. But, uh, you know, at the same time that we, we, we ended up later on doing this, these two albums called uh, Unearthed Volume 1 and Unearthed Volume 2, where we took songs that were good enough to be on records, but we just, you know, let them go at the end of a record and, and then started new. And uh, some of them were quite good songs. But when we got to Unearthed Volume 1 and Unearthed Volume 2, we only used songs from pretty much about 86 on because we had demoed up the other songs, but they were terrible demos and they, wouldn't, they never sounded very good. So. To follow up Earthshaker must have been hard. I mean, did you, yeah. did you feel, as, as a classic question, but did you feel the pressure? I mean, you went over to Europe, to, to England, to, to record uh, the new one, uh, Black Tiger. Uh, how did you feel about that? Was it, was it easy to come up with uh, new great songs? <laughs> um, it's never easy, but uh, you know, it, it, at the same time, we were inspired by the Earthshaker record and, and how well it was doing. Uh, certainly outside of the U.S., it was doing very well, and um, within our own, you know, l you know, areas that we were playing in the, in the U.S., it was doing quite well. So you know, it it uh, it inspired us to to write some good songs right off the bat when we got back into the rehearsal studio to start writing again. But um, we were also now working with a different type of producer, one we'd never worked with before from the standpoint of someone that was really on us. I mean, he was, he was like, you know, had a whip. And it was just literally, he was just like, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. You know, you've got to play it like this or that. You know, he was really on the, especially on the rhythm section. He was on the bass and drums. Very, that was Max Norman. Yeah, Max Norman, yeah. And, you know, he just, he was something else, man. Um, and and uh, plus the other thing was is that um, we were now going to a new, a new country that we'd never been before. You know, we'd never been outside of the U.S. And here we are going to England to record a new record and doing it on a, you know, in a 16th century house, you know, in the middle of the countryside. Uh, it was it was a complete mind-blowing experience for us. You know, we were just like, I see now, city guys, and we're going to be riding out here in the, in the countryside of England. It's, that's going to give us a completely different skew on things, you know. But what was very cool about that, too, was that um, we broke in the middle of, the, of recording the record, and we did our first tour through the UK, and then we came to Holland and played our first show outside, our very first show. Actually, that was the first show outside of the US, and then we went back to the UK and did a quick little tour, and then we finished the record. So after all of that experience, we were just like so keyed up that it, it sort of, I think it pushed the rest of the, the record over the top, you know, it made that so much better. From the moon, I mean, that's the intro for, for the record, but right. also um, for forever. What came first, forever or the intro? I don't remember. <laughs> I think, I think honestly, I think the the for, the forever part came first, and then um, then I think I was messing around in the studio with Max, and I was just playing the intro by itself, and then I said, "Hey, I should put a good, you know a solo. I mean, a, a, a harmony part to it, and so on and so forth." I think that's how it started, but. Um, Eh, memory's a little, a little cloudy about that, but 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 I'm pretty sure that uh, we 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 did the intro to Forever, the, the song Forever, before we came up with uh, From the Moon as just an instrumental part by itself. Of course, the album is a true classic, and you still do a lot of, of the tracks. Of yes, course, it's, yeah. um, I think brilliant. probably Earthshaker and Black Tiger are are the records that we play the most tracks from ever since we've you know recorded those records. Uh, been, it's been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Back in, in the 80s, uh, it was normal to release a new album every year. Right. So in 83, you released uh, Meat Streak. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, it's kind of your, your third album after you got bigger. Yeah, well, you know how it is. Uh, most, most bands, the fans always love their first record or their first two records. You know, and then they start going, what happened to you guys? You know, and, uh, you know, and, and, and quite simply, 
first records are loved so much because they had years to come up with this stuff before they got their record deal. So, you know, they, like I said, we, they had time to play them live, flesh out the tunes, and really become themselves. And now you're stuck, you know, touring and, and then coming back and, and recording a new record within a year's time after the last one. So if you figure that out, it's like, well, you get a tour for six months at least, and then you got to take a break after that, and then you get back and, and you know, that only gives you two months to, to write a record now when you had a year or two years before, you know. So uh, it changes things. But at the same time, like I said, because you're touring and you're, and you're experiencing new things, and you're becoming a better musician because now you're playing live. You, nothing makes you better as a musician, as far as I'm concerned, than playing live. You can spend six years in your in your bedroom practicing and practicing and practicing. You could play six months playing live, and you'll be a better musician, mm -hmm. guaranteed. So you know these kinds of things always help when you're writing the next record. You know all the all those things that that you built up. Now you're becoming better musicians, and hopefully becoming better songwriters. So maybe you can write just as good of songs in a short period of time now. You never know. But, uh, you know, I, I like every one of the records that came after Earthshaker and Black Tiger, all for their own separate things. And um, there were a lot of people that thought Mean Streak was a great record and a lot of people that thought that we changed our direction slightly, you know. Hmm. I, I, I didn't feel that way at the time. When I listen back to it now, I still think it sounds just like how we were at that time. I mean, you know, I didn't feel like it was any different from at least what we wanted to say than Earthshaker was, you know. Mm -hmm. It was just that now we're three years older and three years much more experienced and given the two months to write, you know. I mean, this is this is what happens. I, I, I still love that record a lot, you know. There, there's so many good things in it that that are and and to me what the great thing about YNT is anyway is the fact that we play this heavy stuff and then we play this melodic stuff and and every bit of it has passion the heavy stuff does and the melodic stuff has a lot of feeling to it and each record has you know bits of that in it and and that's what I like about this too as well as you know it has all of those things and everything in between Midnight in Tokyo was, uh, of course, a hit from, from this album. Right. Um, a lot of people think you, you deserved more attention in the States uh, this time. Yeah. Uh, did uh, A&M do a bad promotion work for you over there? A&M was crap. Yeah, yeah. They, they were in the U.S. for us. Um, we literally were kicking butt everywhere else except the U.S. And um, we were, you know, it was Mean Streak, though, that actually started our rise in the U.S., much better, much better after that. Because Mean Streak was the first song that really got a lot of airplay across the country. I mean, Black Tiger did a little bit and Don't Want to Lose a little bit, but it wasn't until, Ursh, until, it wasn't until Mean Streak that all of a sudden we started getting 100 radio stations, 120 radio stations, and we started hitting all, you know, a lot more of the markets in the States. Mm -hmm. So that was really the start of it, and, and it set us up very well for the next record. Plus, we, we did a lot of good tours on Earthshaker. I mean, on uh, on Mean Streak. We we did a tour with uh, Ronnie James Dio. We did a tour with, uh, oh God, can't remember exactly now, but I, I know that we we played at least two or three real good bands through the states. Set us up quite well. Uh, the next album in in rock, which was from from '84, was um, a, maybe a bit more commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, did your label have any impact on, on your music at the time? Your the style on, on your albums? Yes and no. Um, the label had been pressuring us for every record. You know, we need a hit single, we need a hit single for, you know, radio play, so on and so forth. They all do that. But, um, you know, we, we just play the stuff that we wanted to play. But in this particular instance, they hired an outside songwriter to write with us. And uh, we didn't want to do it because we felt that we were writing good songs on our own and this was going to change things a little bit. So they brought in Jeff, Jeff Lieb. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, actually, to be honest with you, I kind of thought it was more or less like, check this song out that Jeff, this guy Jeff Lieb wrote, wrote for, um, I think it was for uh, Lita Ford. He wrote this song. And we thought, oh, that's a really good song. It's, you know, sounds rock and everything. Yeah, it's good, good melody. And so uh, we thought that maybe we were just going to write one song together. And then we ended up, you know, he stayed. <laughs> yeah. 
But to be honest with you, it was still kind of cool anyway, because he had some good ideas, some good melody ideas that we weren't thinking of. And um, I still think we made a really good record here. Um, it was slightly different, and, and certainly he had something to do with that. But also, I think that we were starting to grow better as songwriters and as musicians on this record. So it was a good timing for that to happen for us. And, uh, but at the same time, our biggest single off of this record was something that I wrote when, when I was asleep, literally, and I woke up and I, and I grabbed the guitar so I didn't, wouldn't forget it right off the bat. It was our biggest yeah. single, so, and it had nothing to do with Jeff Lieb. So, That's Lipstick and Leather. Well, it was, it was Lipstick and Leather, and it was uh, uh, Don't Stop Running, those two yeah, songs, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, so th that was the biggest difference with that, with that particular record, was the outside songwriting influence. Uh, the year after you released Open Fire, uh, it's a live album, but uh, of course you had a, a huge hit uh, on that one, Summertime yeah, Girls. Right. Uh, a studio track in the middle of uh, the live track sounds, well, a bit weird, at least today. <laughs> yes, it, it was weird. And it was all because of uh, A&M's paranoia. Um, we were supposed to be going in to record the next studio record, which was ended up being down for the count. Um, and we had what we thought were enough good songs. And a &M said, no, you don't have it yet. And we had Summertime Girls. We had all, all, all kinds of really good songs for the record. And they just didn't like them. And so they said, hey, you know, well, no, we, we, I think it was sort of our manager's idea. He goes, well, look, you know, everybody's been asking for a live record out of these guys. Why don't we do a live record right now? We'll do it locally so we don't have to go anywhere to do it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, by the time that thing gets mixed and everything, it'll give us more time to write more songs for the next studio record. So we did that, and we thought, well, since they didn't like, because they literally told us, oh, yeah, in Summertime Girls, I kicked that song across the, across the, the parking lot. I thought it sucked so bad. <laughs> so this is what our a &R guy at, at the record company said. So we thought, well, if they hate that song... Hey, it's a pretty good song, man. We should just, the hell with it. Let's do it live, you know? And we'll do it on the live record. We'll do it on open fire. So we did it live, and we were mixing it. And our manager gave some rough mix copies to the record company. And somebody else at the record company heard the live version of Summertime Girls and said, what is this song? What is this song? How come we didn't hear this? You know? Go in and record that now. You got to do that now, man. You got to do a studio version of that song and let's release that as a single. So, of course, you know, they didn't want to wait for us to do it on the next studio record. They wanted to put it out now. And so that's why they, they stuck it on the live record. It was a really stupid thing, but, you know, but I must admit, it was good timing, though, because it came out right before summer and that video was on heavy rotation on MTV. So, okay, then it's uh, down for the count at the five. Was, why that title, Down for the Count, is that... Uh, you know, it's funny because Phil was mentioning to me one time, he said, you ever notice how something happens, we'll either play a show at some venue that has a weird name and it's, and it's like uh, prophetic what's going to happen, right? And Down for the Count was like, that was it, we're down and out, you know, with A&M, that's over, we're, we're, we're leaving, it's, it's all over. And... Uh, when we got rid of, um, when we let our drummer, original drummer, go, um, I think the, the show before the last show we played was at some place that, that made sense. That you know, it, it, and the same this last time we played the, uh, oh God, what was the name of that place? I can't even remember. But the, the name of the the name of the place that we played was like, you know, last chance you know, bar and grill or whatever the hell it was. I don't remember. But anyway, yeah, I, it was actually named by the record company. And that's because the A&R guy at the record company had this photo that was, that was on his wall for years and years, which ended up being the front cover. And, uh, and it was down for the count, Count Dracula. You know, that's what it was supposed to be. It's supposed to be like a, you know, a trick on, on a phrase or something, you know. And, uh, of course, it, it was prophetic because it was 
we were out of there. It was the last record for A&M mm-hmm. because uh, we got so frustrated with working with A&M by that time because they had taken all these good records that we had given them and basically sat on their hands, you know. They, they didn't, we did all the work. They did barely anything to, to promote us through the States. But even with that, we still became very popular throughout the U.S., regardless of them. So we were, uh, we were flying high. We were doing Summertime Girls was hot and heavy on the charts. Um, and uh, we had the, one of the biggest uh, tours of the year with Motley Crue, and just the two of us going throughout the States. And then we left them and went out with Aerosmith through the States. I mean, we, we had everything. Everything was working, except that the record company wouldn't release another single. Even though that single was in the 40s and it was going up the chart, it didn't matter to them. They were so crap. So we just literally had our, our manager get us off the label as we were still touring for that record. And um, it was just over. So, so really, of course, knowing that they weren't going to do anything for Down for the Count, and uh, it, it, was, it was a wasted record, unfortunately. And it was a frustrating record because it was the most um, record company influenced. They had really messed with our heads. You know, yeah, and it was just a bad scene. So, I mean, it's still some good songs on that record. I mean, uh, I loved uh, songs like um, which we play now. Uh, looks like uh, uh, looks like trouble. Good song. Uh, Anything for money. Uh, there's a lot of good rock and roll songs on that record, and and some fans like some of the uh, more commercial stuff too as well. Um, but uh, you know, it was it was it ended up sort of being a wasted record, almost like uh, Struck Down was. It was like. It was out right when a record company didn't care about us, you know, especially the most. So it happens a lot of people, you know. I mean, we're certainly not the only band that gets dumped on by the record company. And then I guess I kind of started a new era. You were signed to, to Geffen Records. You, you had your, your first lineup changes. I mean, uh, Leonard, Leonard Hayes uh, left right. the band right. and you released Contagious <coughs> in 87 and, and 10 in 1990. And uh, how were those times? I mean, how much did uh, Geffen uh, expect from you? Well, the expectation was how much did we expect from them? Yeah. Because their whole trip was we'll never we'll never let you guys lie so still, you know, with good product. We're really going to get behind you. We're we're not going to do what A&M did. But at the same time they wanted us to just be ourselves, no pressure, just right. And when you think you guys have it, send us the songs and if we don't think you have it yet you know just keep writing but we're not going to tell you what to do you know so this was good this is a good relationship and so uh but in between that of course we had to we had to find a new drummer so we auditioned 33 drummers <laughs> tell me that wasn't easy um and that was after it was whittled down from like 500 you know but luckily we didn't have to see all those people but our manager whittled them down and we, we auditioned 33 drummers it was hell And we're writing songs in between that, you know, with no drummer. And then we asked some friends of ours, like Troy Lucchetta, who's in Tesla, uh, to come down and, and do some some uh, drumming for us while we could, you know, so we could have a, a physical drummer there to play with. But um, I thought Contagious was a great record. I thought it was a really good record. We we had uh, we had a lot of time to write. We didn't have a lot of time to play the songs live. But uh, but still, I thought it was very good. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I thought it was a really good record. And uh, unfortunately, as what was always happening in the 80s for us, well, even in the 70s, of course, with, with London, same thing. We released the record, starting to get some play on Contagious. We're starting to go places. And uh, um, the first record for uh, Guns N' Roses comes out. And uh, the most popular record at that time for Whitesnake in the U.S. comes out. So, you know, we're up against Still in the Night and the first, you know, the first Guns N' Roses record. And we're selling, but we're selling really good. And we're on our very first ever headline tour through the States. And we're kicking butt. I mean, we're, we're putting the people in. But the record company just said, well, we're selling a couple of thousand a week on your record. We're selling like... 20,000 a week for White Snake. Guess who's getting the most attention? It's like, yeah, okay. So again, we got dumped on. Uh, the same thing happened for 10, and and we spent a long time writing for 10 because we wanted to just you know do it right again. 
And again, the record company said, we're so sorry what happened to you guys on the last one. We're not going to do that this time. And they did. And they did it very quickly. We were out on the road for two weeks and they said, no, we're not going to release anything else. And so I told the guys before we were record, before we uh, released 10, I said, if, a, if, a, if this record company dumps on us one more time, you know, another one of these bad experiences, I think it's a sign. I think it's time that we, we hang it up. And as soon as that happened, two months on, out, out after, that, after that record, and we spent so much time making a great record, just said, all right, that's it. Let's forget it. Let's move on and do something else. You know, let's go our separate ways. And so we said, let's book a, let's book a local tour, five shows on the West Coast. It's, it'll be our farewell tour. And, of course, you know, it was manic, and it was, everything was sold out, and, and, and we had, you know, all these terrible, fun feelings, but yet we were, you know, terrible feelings of, you know, we're never going to see each other anymore and all this stuff. And that was, the, that was how it was. And basically, of course, it was many, many years later, we decided to, to put some, a couple of independent records out. And uh, it was a bad time to release anything that was considered our style of music because grunge and all these other types of musics were, were in, the, were in the, the public eye. So. But luckily, 2001, we decided to come back and try it again. And um, we just did a couple of local shows, and then some European promoters found out we were playing, and they said, would you guys like to come over and play some festivals in, in Europe? And, of course, that was easy for me because I never thought we should have stopped playing Europe. And, but we did. It was, a, it was a terrible decision. And so I said, yeah, let's do it. And once we played Sweden Rock 2003 and, uh, and I think Arrow after that, we just said, what are we doing? It's a good band. Let's just keep going. And, and we never stopped since. You, you said once that um, the world isn't holding its breath for another record from, from YNT. Does that mean you will keep on playing the classics that people like to hear and uh, not record anything new or are you writing? Well, still? that was, yeah, that was where we were doing. Uh, you know, we were of the opinion that, you know, we have 15, 16 records out there. People don't want to hear anything new. They want to hear all the old classics and or some of these deep tracks that they never got a chance to hear. Mm. Well, and the more that we play, we couldn't stop playing longer sets. So now we play two hours minimum every time we play, every night. And sometimes two and a quarter hours, sometimes two and a half. You know, they have to almost pull us off the stage because we have so many songs we want to play. But uh, at the same time, we realize that we have to write new material to, to, to feel like, you know, just, just to give us more momentum, you know, along the way. And, you know, it will, no matter how brilliant the record may be, it might be the best record we ever do or it could be crap. Who knows? But if it is the best record we ever do, still... Fans are only going to want to hear maybe one, two, three at the most in a, in a two-hour set. And it's like, okay, now, that's great. That's great, guys. But how about Black Tiger? Come on, man, play forever. You know. So, but no, I, I really do believe that we're going to finish a record and get it out in 2009, even if it's at the end of the year.